Chapter 13. A Terrible Story. Thursday morning, the 31st of August, 1939. Matilda Stephanie Roberts, you look like you've slept in the mud of Flanders, cried up Mum, when Tilly let herself into the house and went down to the kitchen. Mum was standing at the scrubbed wooden table. Tilly flew into her arms, closed to tears after Tinkerbell's funeral. Now, now, you silly Billy, said, Mil- said Mum, soothing Tilly's hair flat against her head. Dad came into the kitchen and said, Where's my hug? Tilly turned to him and buried her face into his old woolly jumper with its tobacco and soap smell. Dagged hugged her tight and lifted her off the ground. Did you have a topping time? said Dad. Wilf, said Mum, shaking her head. You sound like one of those of the children. It was smashing, said Tilly. I'm starving. Mum shook her finger at her. You'll get your breakfast when I put a nice clean when you put a nice clean dress and scrub those hands and face my girl. Yes, Mum, said Tilly, racing from the kitchen. The smell of bacon frying was heavenly as Tilly came back, glowing with her from her wash. Mum put down a huge plate of bacon, eggs and fried bread in front of her. Dad was already eating, his eyes glued to the newspaper. Still no word from Germany, Mother, he muttered. Why can't Hitler leave poor little Poland alone, said Mum, frying two more slices as Tilly wolfed her breakfast. Because Mr Flipping Hitler wants this war, said Dad, clattering his knife and fork onto his plate. I hope they're ready for the blackout. It starts tomorrow, Friday. But we're not at war yet, Dad, said Tilly. We'll soon, we soon will be. I've done my best, Will, said Mum nervously. You know what Ted Bow's like? Ted Bow was their local air raid warden and was already patrolling the streets with a tin helmet and whistle, bossing everyone around, telling them to cover their windows. Dad murmured behind his paper. Ted said something about stray pets hiding out in the old factories. He'd seen the Scudder boys going that way. He poked his head round the paper and narrowed his eyes at Tilly. Have they said anything to you? Tilly felt a flutter in the pit of her stomach, and her hand shook so much she nearly spilt her tea. No, she muttered, keeping her eyes on the plate. And stay away from the Scudders, said Mum, wiping her hands on her apron. Tilly seized the chance to change the subject from hiding pets and said... It isn't fair, Dad. Never on the others. They're always starving. We only get a bit of bread and marge for breakfast and sometimes no tea at all, said Tilly. Dad gave a big sigh and put his paper down. Bert Scudder was gassed in the trenches, said Dad. Had a weak chest ever since and it's hard for him to get regular work. But this war, when it comes, is going to change everything, eh, Mother? If you say so, Wilf. Oh, yes, said Dad. We men who were in the trenches, we don't want another war. We know what it means. Mum shot Dad a frightened glance and started to pick up the empty plates. But there's no choice this time, Dad went on. It'll be a a fight for survival against the evil of Hitler and the Nazis. But afterwards, once it's over, you mark my words, things will have to change in this country. Working men won't put up with low wages and hungry children anymore. And if we meet a German here, said Tilly in a cautious, cautious voice, Dad gave a snort, you'd better not. But if it's just a boy... Oh, she means the Evans's little lad, said Mum brushing a strand of hair out of her eyes. They took one of the Jewish children from the trains. Poor little thing. What's his name now? Oh, yes, Judy. Oh, no, no, Rudy. The Germans were treating their Jews very badly, so it's all right if you keep an eye on him, said Dad. He's not the enemy. It's a relief. That's a relief, thought Tilly, as she stood up to help clear the table. Then another thought came into her mind. What will happen to the German children's pets if they're at war? Dad turned the page of his paper and muttered, Same thing as here, probably. No one wants a mad dog running around. around, around. There's bombing. So it's happening all, all of the countries, Tilly asked herself. Grown-ups murdering the children's pets is so horrible, horribly unfair. Dad had gone off to work until he was drying up the breakfast things when there was a knock at the door. It was Lottie and she was holding a small cardboard box. Tucked under one arm was a large paper carrier bag. Alex said to bring this here to you, and there's a note, said Lottie. I can't read it. Tilly grabbed her and pulled her inside, hissing, Shh, we don't want the grown-ups hearing us. They're getting very suspicious. She pushed Lottie upstairs, calling out to Mum. Just a friend, we're playing in my room. Once they were in the bedroom and the door closed, Tilly took the box and opened it. Inside were two baby hamsters, fast asleep in a nest of cotton wool. Oh, how sweet, she cried out, and took the note Lottie was holding out. She saw, with a thrill, that it was written in code, our very first message. Wait till Rosie sees this. On the note was written, Eselp def 
root syrup. Is it English? said Lottie in a puzzled voice. Tilly laughed. Oh yes, it's our code. You write all the words backwards, see? She pointed to each word and read out, please feed our babies. That is so clever, said Lottie. Hitler is mad if he thinks he can beat you English children. She opened the bag and was carrying, that she was carrying and said in a proud voice, I bring this. Mr and Mrs Green, the people I work for, throw away too much food. They are very rich. The bag was full of scraps of meat. Tilly gave a low whistle. Exactly what we need. Well done. Maybe you can help Hanno have a tiny bit too, please. Of course, we share everything. Lottie's face broke into a smile and she looked around to his room. You have so many books. I love to read, but all my books are at home. In, in Germany, the Nazi children burnt books on huge fires. Burn? Tilly was horrified. Why would you do that? They burn books by anyone they don't agree with. I saw it in Frankfurt, our city. Papa pulls me away because I want to rescue the books. I was only ten. But he says that they are barbarians. Tilly was so shocked she couldn't speak for a minute. What would Rosie say about burning books? She looked at the little supply of books on her bookshelf, her birthday and her Christmas presents. She pulled one out and said, Have you read this? You can borrow it if you like. Lottie took the book in her hands as if it was precious jewels and read the title aloud. The Railway Children by E. Nesbitt. Thank you. Tilly, you are so kind. You're such a kind girl. She's my favourite author and when you've read all my books, Rosie has loads more. Oh, you are a true friend and I thank you from the top of my heart. I will write to Mitty and tell her. Tilly nodded and then she said, Mum says that Rudy is Jewish. Is that why you came here? She stopped and her cheeks flushed as the other girl lowered her eyes. Sorry, said Tilly, flustered. I didn't mean to be rude. Oh no, said Lotta, you are right. We are Jewish. The Nazis are cruel to everyone, but especially the Jews. They do very bad things. Tilly's mouth felt suddenly dry and she licked her lips. Like what? Lottie hesitated and then she said in a quiet voice, they take Papa and other Jewish men and make them cut the grass in the football stadium. That didn't sound too bad to Tilly. Did he use shears? He asked. His teeth. But I don't understand, whimpered Tilly back. It sounded like some sort of joke. All day and in the night, down on the knees, 20 Jewish men, they are to cut all the grass with their teeth. Lottie's eyes were lowered and Tilly could see that she had gone red with the shame of it. Lottie continued. When Papa came home, his mouth was all bloody. He could not speak for one week. Hitler wants to kill all the Jews. Can't your parents escape too? Lottie stared at Tilly for a moment and then she pulled a piece of paper from her pocket and opened it. Lottie writes to me almost every day. She is worried for I forget my German. She gave a little grin. Then she read aloud from the letter. What a lot of mistakes you are making in German. It is a good thing your English has improved so much. But don't forget everything that will be deplorable. Think of us here in Germany. Lottie paused as if searching for something in the letter and then she said, Oh, here it is. Nothing is happening with us, but we are prepared to leave at any time. We are trying to get permits to go to Cuba and Chile. Can't they come to England? Tilly hadn't heard of Cuba. Where on earth was it? Lottie shook her head. England has refused them. Then she put the book under her arm and said, Now I must go. You will see Rudy later. Yes, of course, said Tilly. They went downstairs and Tilly let Lottie out. She was just about to grab her bike and go off to the den when Mum came down the hall and handed her a piece of paper. Shopping, please, Tilly. But I said I'll meet Rosie. It was already eleven and the pets in the zoo would all be getting very hungry. Off you go, snapped her mother. They'll be rationing soon and I'll have to stock up. You should see what Mrs Benson has got in her larder. Enough to feed an army and there's only the two of them. Tilly gave a sigh and went outside to get on her bike. She rode off the high street and just as she neared the bank she spotted the girl on the horse. Sophia Highcliffe Barnes, wearing a pale green dress and black painted shoes. Walking ahead of her was her mother, very smartly dressed, and another woman wearing a bright red hat. Tilly was about to accelerate past when Sophia caught her eye and beckoned to her. How strange, thought Tilly, but there was something about the look in the older girl's face that made her pedal over. Hello, she said in a cautious voice. Thanks ever so much for stopping, said Sophia quietly, glancing at the two women who had stopped outside the bank. It's just the upstairs maid, said her brother, had left their tortoise in a safe place, a hut in the woods. Sophia hesitated and Tilly couldn't help wondering how many maids they had. But she said, why? I thought you might be able to help because 
Sophia's voice was drowned out by the rising voice of the woman in the red hat. This absolutely dreadful murder of our pets. There's no word for it. Tilly and Sophia exchanged glances. Aunt Edith, whispered Sophia, staring round at her mother, who had a deep frown on her face. Well, I suppose the upper classes might be able to save their little cats and dogs, boomed Sophia's mother. But for goodness sake, Edith, no one needs a flea-biting mutt for the poor. Then Sophia's mother swept into the bank, followed by Aunt Edith shaking her head. I have to go, spluttered Sophia. My mother and... She gave a shrug. So maybe she's not such a snob after all, thought Tilly. Look, you mustn't tell the grown-ups. Promise. Oh no, you can trust me. Absolutely, says Sophia, her eyes wide with hope. All right, we're in the hut beyond the thicket at the end of the field. Our password is Dooftep. Sophia gave a swift nod and ran off to the bank, looking rather like a frightened rabbit herself. It was past midday before Tilly could finally escape from Mum. She had to sneak the hamster's box and the bag of scraps out of the house. Once outside, she set the box into her basket, hung the carrier bag over the handlebars and pushed her bike onto the street, set off towards the canal. As she reached the towpath, she could see huge fires burning as far as the bent of the bend of a quarter of a mile away. The flames lit up the water, turning it deep red. Two workmen came past her and one said to her the other, There's half a million cats and dogs in London. Are they going to burn them all? They both sniffed and pushed some sacks deeper into one of the fires on the, scent, on the canal bank. Tilly pedalled as fast as she could away from the horrible sight, her eyes smarting with smoke, and only stopped to catch her breath once she reached the fields. Gulping the clean air, she saw, caught sight of a ladybird on a leaf, and the old rhyme came to her mind. Ladybird, ladybird, fly away home. Your house is on fire. Your babies are burning. Shuddering, she got back on her bike and rode off to the den.